Hi everyone. Last lecture we talked about the Declaration of Independence, how we have finally reached a threshold from which the colonists cannot turn back. War is on. So now we need to discuss how that war will play out. To begin with, we need to understand um, Britain's strategy in this war. Uh, because they have such a formidable navy, they're going to put it to good use. One of the very first things they're going to do is establish a blockade of American ports along the East Coast. Charleston, for example, Boston, Philadelphia, New York. And their hope is, is by uh, cutting off the, the Americans' trade with other countries, that they'll be able to starve them out, so to speak. Uh, that they'll be, that uh, very quickly, uh, the Americans will have such a shortage of basic goods that they won't be able to continue the fight. So they will quickly establish this blockade. It will be successful in choking off trade between the colonists and the rest of the world, and, and it will definitely lead to some pretty painful shortages and skyrocketing costs for many basic goods. For instance, a bushel of wheat that sold for less than a dollar in 1777, just two years later, by 1779, that bushel of wheat had gone from one dollar to eighty dollars. And as you might expect it is the poor that are suffering the most, as many of them simply cannot afford the necessities of life now. We'll also see that in many of these port cities, unemployment will, will spike uh, with no trade going in and out. Shipbuilders, um, barrel makers, rope makers, you know, um, sailors, they have nothing to do uh, during the war here. And so many families will start to suffer uh, because they have lost the income of one or, uh, or both parents in some cases. In order to compensate for a lack of, of basic goods, you see that many American women will step in and increase their production of homespun cloth, for example. Uh, many women contributed the war effort by making uniforms for soldiers in the Continental Army, socks, other military supplies. Um, so, yeah, they, they will play a crucial role in this case. But their service was not simply restricted to Betsy Ross, you know, the picture that we have here of sewing a flag. That's all nice and good. Um, but some women actually participated a little bit more directly in the war effort. One of the most acclaimed female participants during the the Revolutionary War was Nancy Hart, for instance, who lived in Georgia in Wilkes County. Her husband was a staunch patriot and was gone in many cases for months at a time, helping out the Continental Army. She not only held the farm down and, and, and you know, began to shoulder uh, what was known as traditionally men's work during that time period, plowing the fields, fixing fences, uh, those sorts of things, but she also would disguise herself as she would dress up as kind of a simple-minded man and she would wander uh, close to British encampments and garrisons to listen in for any information that she could then pass on uh, to her husband and Patriot authority. She was a spy of sorts. She was also feisty about defending her home and the Patriot cause. For example, one evening a group of five to six loyalists invaded her home and demanded that she tell them where an important rebel leader was. She refused, however, and the men demanded to stay and that she cook dinner for them and serve them. Uh, she did. She also served them wine and deliberately proceeded to get them drunk. Then, without them noticing, she and her daughter seized the men's guns, which were stacked in the corner. When the men noticed what was going on, they stood up in a fury and heart shot two of the men and held the others at bay until her husband and the patriots uh, living nearby could come and take the men as prisoners. In a few isolated incidents, too, like that of Deborah Sampson of Plimpton, Massachusetts, she actually disguised herself as a man and fought for three years in the Continental Army, helping out the Patriot cause, and she was wounded twice in battle. But this was, as I said, exceedingly rare. And part of the reason why this war was so tricky um, for both the British and also for the colonists was everyone looked the same. It was really hard to tell who your enemy was, and from the standpoint of the colonists, uh, there were a, there was a very high percentage of so-called loyalists during the war. They were also sometimes referred to as Tories.
These loyalists or Tories um, numbered in, you know, the tens of thousands, perhaps 15 to 20 percent of the colonies remained loyal to Britain in during the revolution. They were not interested in breaking away. And they all had their various reasons for why they, they preferred Britain. Some of them were in the direct employment of the king. They served as judges or tax collectors, what have you. In that case, you know, that was their bread and butter. Or for many merchants whose primary clients were British clients. They understood that the war would disrupt their business and that they would likely lose a lot of money. Others, though, were worried about the fear of mob rule. For example, as one Boston loyalist by the name of Matthew Biles noted, he said the following of his neighbors, quote, They call me a brainless Tory. But tell me, he said, which is better, to be ruled by one tyrant 3,000 miles away or by 3,000 tyrants not a mile away. What Biles is referring to is the fact that there was a lot of violence against against loyalists during the war. If you were suspected to be, you know, providing information to the enemy, you might very well be tarred and feathered, uh, which could result in your death, or, or at very least your disfigurement. You might have your home burned. You might have uh, physical acts of violence committed against your family. So take a look, for example, at this political cartoon that I have from the period, which is very um, anti-colonial, uh, the horse America throwing his master. In other words, for some who remain loyal to Britain, they may not like the king, King George the Third, but he was 3,000 miles away across an entire ocean. All right. What they were more worried about was, as this artist represents, the colonists themselves, the mob mentality, almost like a wild animal. You never knew. It was very unpredictable what might happen. So for some loyalists, it was they weren't really sure why they wanted to break away from Britain because their neighbors did not seem like the type of people that really should be in charge of a government. Some slaves also sided with the British. Some of it you could put down to simple anger, uh, understandably, uh, at their owners, the colonists, uh, the people that were mis mistreating them on a daily basis. When they hear about you know, the f upcoming fight between their, their owners and the British, some of them simply sided with the British. For others, it was Dunmore's proclamation that, that caught their interest, a promise of freedom that was extended by uh, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor of Virginia, a promise of freedom to slaves who helped out the British in fighting during the Revolution. For some, this was an inducement for them to, to begin trying to get to British lines. Unfortunately, not many were able to make it to British lines. Uh, further, for some of those who were taken into British custody, they were not only not freed during the war, they were not freed after the war. Uh, some of them were simply re-enslaved and taken down to Barbados or other British holdings in the Caribbean to work on sugarcane plantations. Some were, however, uh, an estimated 3,000 slaves with the permission of their former owners after the war. The British did resettle some of them in places like Nova Scotia. But in general, we don't see uh, huge numbers of slaves uh, siding with the British, mainly because uh, they don't trust the British. <laughs> they're, they're worried that these are promises that are being made to them that simply won't be fulfilled. Others actively uh, were on the side of the colonists. They could understand issues uh, related to you know, the economic dependence that, that Britain forced upon the colonies. And some of them were willing to fight on behalf of the Continental Army. Uh, in fact, very early on, you see black soldiers uh, at engagements like Lexington, uh, at the Battle of Bunker Hill outside um, Boston. Uh, early in the war, we see a number of especially free blacks joining um, the Patriot cause in this case. Overall, you'll see between five to 8,000 black soldiers served in the Revolutionary Army, some 5% of the entire fighting force. Uh, and, uh, and many of them, unfortunately, not really receiving any kind of recognition at the time for their contributions to the cause. Unfortunately, no matter who was fighting on behalf of the Patriots, they were at a tremendous disadvantage when compared to their enemy, the British. We can, if you'll take a look at the slide, you'll just see uh, very quickly at the get-go, uh, Britain has a much larger population. They have the world's largest navy during this period and among the largest uh, standing trained armies in the world. They have highly experienced military leaders 
many of whom, uh, you know, were uh, had served in the Seven Years' War in North America. Also, crucially, if you'll notice, the British had the support of almost all Native American tribes. When you think about it, this kind of makes sense. It is the Native American tribes who've been continually pushed off of their land here in North America by the colonists. And attempts on the part of the British through the Proclamation of 1763, for instance, which forbade the colonists from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains, attempts by the British to stop the further westward movement of their colonists had simply been overturned or ignored altogether by the colonists. So it's not surprising that many Native American tribes are happy to take up arms against the colonists. Unfortunately, what this will mean for them after the war is when they sided with the British, they will be punished by the victorious um, Americans. For instance, uh, a statement by the U.S. Congress of Confederation in 1783 said the following, quote, the Indian tribes by joining the British in the Revolution, forfeited their rights to possession of lands within the United States. They continued on to say, quote, the new country would be justified in compelling the Indians now to retire to Canada or to the unknown areas beyond the Mississippi River. So, yeah, uh, that will be a, a huge setback for many Native American tribes who sided with the British during the war. After the war, uh, they will uh, be punished for it. Uh, the Americans do have their own advantages. Uh, they certainly have a much, much smaller army, only about 18,000 men, compared to about 48,000 men in the, the British Army. But they have uh, the home field advantage. They are fighting in familiar territory. They know the landscape. Also, they their enemy has to maintain incredibly long supply lines, and it can take months across the Atlantic Ocean for the British to get reinforcements of guns or men, uh, medical supplies, what have you. We'll also see that the uh, Patriots will have French aid. Remember we said that France was willing to side with the Americans in fighting off their, their mortal enemies, the British. And then finally, another American advantage is George Washington's willingness and many other uh, commands within the Continental Army's willingness to use alternate ways of fighting known as guerrilla warfare tactics against their enemy mainly because the British outnumber uh, the Americans. Uh, Washington is very clear that he wants to kind of um, take the fight to areas in which the Americans might have an advantage. He wants to use guerrilla tactics like using the element of surprise or using their knowledge of the landscape to trap their enemy into situations in which they can't escape very easily. For example, Washington observed, quote, unless we are absolutely forced into it, he said, we shall avoid a large battle. With the fate of America at stake, he said, our job is to prolong this war as much as possible. And the only way the U.S., or excuse me, the Americans can kind of hang in the fight is if they don't lose thousands of men on the battlefield. All right, so they're looking for alternate ways to strike at the enemy. Francis Marion is a good example of one of these uh, kind of uh, Continental Army tacticians that is thinking about uh, looking for ways to peel off a few groups of soldiers here from the British, a few others. He'll earn the nickname the Swamp Fox because he will, through these series of small raids, uh, begin capturing, recapturing American prisoners of war and liberating them, and then seemingly disappearing into the swamps outside of Charleston. It's those small victories like that that Francis Marion has that keep the war effort going. And other crucial victories like the Battle of Trenton and in particular the Battle of Saratoga in New York State that will lead the French ultimately to begin committing real resources to the war. They kind of hung back the first year or so. Um, but then when they start to see how scrappy, uh, how tenacious the colonists were, they begin to start sending real resources. And French aid was essential to the Battle of Yorktown, which is probably the most decisive battle of the war, um, in which uh, French and American troops forced the surrender of General Cornwallis and some 8,000 troops. Essentially, we're going to see that by 1783, Britain is tired of fighting. 
They can keep up the fight. They have more soldiers in reserve, but the British public is turning against it. It's been all these years. They still haven't won. How much more do they have to commit to the fight? In this case, let me give you a heads up. You do need to know that it's the Treaty of Paris, 1783, that will end the Revolutionary War. In this case, you need to know the date. All right, so please memorize the date. But essentially, both sides shake hands and walk away. There's no exchange of territory. Britain will promise to leave their forts on the western frontier. The colonists will promise not to persecute loyalists and pay back their debts. And that is the end of the war.